uh, is an agenda that basically represents what our party, the Unity Party, stands for. But I dare say that for many of the others who share the same kind of commitment to our country, that their agenda is a national agenda. Because we have all agreed, just as was pointed out by, by Jackie, by Morris and others, that at this point in time, what we need is to focus on Liberia and to make sure that we can all have a program in which we can all contribute and we can all share in the benefits of our land. And so that agenda calls for what we call national renewal. So you hear people talk every day of the new Liberia. We all want to share in this new Liberia. We want to know what this new Liberia is all about. We know that we must start first and foremost with what I said, that we must start with a social agenda. And that social agenda is very simple. It's one that says that no matter what we are, no matter what our tribe, no matter what our religion, no matter what our county, no matter who our father or our mother, where we were born, we still are one people. And that if we look into each of our heritage and our background, you will find a covenant for a nation that's still small, three million people. You will find that we do have certain linkages, linkages that go back to our ancestry. And we want to reach out and find that and have this social renewal so that we can say that we are Liberians first and we are everything else next. That's part of our social agenda. To break this long-standing schism that has existed in our society, whether it's because you Congo or country or Crown or Gula or Basso or Kru, you know, whatever it is, that right now our focus is to see us united as one people with one destiny in mind. We hope you can endorse that social agenda and you can help us to find that. And we also, we also have an agenda that has to do with an economic agenda. You know, we recognize the fact that God has richly blessed our nation. We have been endowed so well with natural resources of any kind you can think of. Mineral resources, water resources, forest resources, agricultural resources, and today, thank God, human resources. Many of you represent that in this room. But yet, we have an economy that today is so depressed that 85% of our people are unemployed, that we still today do not have water and light in our capital city. What has gone wrong? We need a new agenda in which we are going to try to enable us to unleash the creativity and industry of our people by redefining the role of government and making sure that the government does not do those things which it does not have the capacity to do and should not be doing to enable the private sector to become the engine of growth. And we want to see many of you in this room who are business people come and take the dominating role in your economy so that once so we can't say the minimum again that the Lebanese or the corporate bodies or the firestones or all of those are controlling our economy. So that agenda is to improve Liberian entrepreneurship to make sure that we place emphasis on our small farmers and our marketeers, which have been the resilient elements of our economy, to make sure that we use our natural resources for the good of the people and a community in which they have been amply placed by God to make sure that those people participate in whatever decision it is that has to do with the use and the allocation of those resources. We have, of course, a great, a great, great challenge in trying to build our infrastructure, both social infrastructure and economic infrastructure. Our social infrastructure has as a centerpiece education. We cannot today we have the youths of our land, many of whom have not been to school because of the war, because of the deterioration in our educational system, either they have not been, or the quality of education they have received is so poor 
and they cannot compete in today's world. So education is at the heart of this one, trying to bring sure our youth people, trying to reduce the illiteracy level today about 65% by being able to provide opportunities, giving compulsory primary education to all of our young people, trying to create vocational schools for many of our youth who have been bypassed by the educational system to enable them to have a skill where they too can have a job and they can become productive citizens once again. That economic agenda requires that each and every one of you think where you fit, how you can make a contribution. What can you do to be able to help us to achieve that? How can we create the environment for private capital and private investment, changing around the kinds of corporate endeavor where we have the exploitation of our resources to the extent that the benefits that accrue to the nation is so immeasurable that today, after 100 years of firestorm, you still have some people on the plantation living in houses that are windowless. How do we change those things? Making sure that in our forestry sector, for example, we can preserve the forest for future generations. Uh, we have, of course, you can't do all of these things unless you have good governance. And I'm lucky to have served in the past 18 months as the head of the Governance Reform Commission, where we've been working on the agenda for structural changes in the country. And so governance, I think if I were to ask any of you, what in the area of governance do you think we ought to address. I'm quite sure that the majority of you would answer corruption. Because that's an issue that we read all about every day that we face. Fiscal indiscipline, fiscal impropriety has been part of our nation's history. Regime after regime, it has just grown in intensity until today it becomes a cancer a cancer that is eating away the lifeblood of our society. And so we have to do things. What we are doing in that regard is working on, first of all, when I say redefine the role of government, then making sure that we reform the civil service so that once again, people serve what we're working for the government. We serve in keeping with a code of conduct, a code of conduct that is going to have built into it not only the meritocracy, that has to do with selection processes and performance and proper retirement and proper compensation to be able to minimize the chances that people will feel compelled to violate the trust. But penalties so that if you do violate the public trust, you are going to have to bear the penalty for that. Uh, that economic agenda is now being formulated and we hope that it will enable us to be able to put to use our resources. We have problems, no doubt. Many of you who are economists in this room will say to me, how can you meet all of this? Where are the resources? What are you going to do with the $3 billion external debt that we have? But what we have to say is that we have to start first looking at our resources, using them well, allocating them well, being able to attract the private capital and investment, and then there are the kinds of facilities out there that can bring that kind of relief and with good economic performance and a sound economic policies, we think that we can get the support of the international community to enable us to be able to get the relief schemes where we can reduce the external debt and we can then be able to tap into the kinds of facilities that gave us the huge sums of money to be able to address our infrastructure needs. So those are some of the things that are ongoing as we're formulating it. Of course, in our region, Liberia will not have peace. Will not have peace unless there's peace in the West Africa region. And in the West Africa region today, the proliferation of guns is so astounding. And we know our poorest borders. And so part of our agenda has to be good relationships with all of our neighboring states. Making sure that we all respect each other's agenda. Making sure that we have the kinds of support and interaction with each other where we start the process of regional cooperation and integration so that the mobility of goods and services across borders will enable our people to be able to start
start the kinds of economic activity that will employ people throughout the sub-region and thereby minimize the chances of their vulnerability to recruitment for the kinds of things. So here we are today, Liberia faces a crossroads. We've had opportunities before. They have come several times in our nation's history, and we've not been able to respond to those opportunities and to get our country moving and get our country changed to the place where everyone can have a stake in their society. But this time around, I implore you, I urge you to think about it. To think about this new crossroads that we face. To think about the challenges that we have. The political challenges of being able to be free, the freedom of choice at all levels. So that nobody will feel that they have to be compelled. Nobody will feel disadvantaged. Each one can feel you have equal opportunity and social equity so that you can be able to come back. And if you don't come back, your children can come back, as Morris said, that they can have the option, should they not want to stay out of the country, they will have a place they can call home, a place they can go and they can get a job, and they can work, and they can have satisfaction, they can be safe, and they can live, and they can be very proud that they are Liberians. This is what we're striving to do. I know that there will be questions on this, and I know that there will be many issues. And let me say that we do not have any monopoly on ideas as to where our country should go. You too must weigh in to this process. You too must tell us, those of us who are there, what do you think we ought to do to be able to make the country a better place for all of us, no matter who we are. I urge you, when you take the floor, I know you want to ask questions. I'll try my best to respond to those questions, but don't just ask questions. You tell me something too. Tell me something that I can take back home, which I can factor into the formulation of the new agenda that we're working on, so that you can feel like you too have had a part in that that the new nation that we create also represents and has your footprints and your imprimatur on it. That's the whole purpose of this meeting, is to connect with you, is to be able to exchange with you, is to be able to work with you, so that together we can work to make our country better. I want to thank you for the opportunity of being here. I want to thank you for being what you are. And I thank you on behalf of all Liberians whom you have helped. They all recognize what you do. Many of you, not only you here in Minnesota, but Liberians all over the United States, who send regularly, who send to their family, to their friends, to their associates, the kind of assistance that enable them to survive in a very difficult environment. And so on their behalf, I just wish to thank you for that and to say with that help, we think that the change mentality, the change of attitude that we're working on in the country is beginning to happen. And we invite you to get on that positive train. We invite you to see the hope, to see the light at the end of the tunnel, that you can contribute to the restoration and the renewal of your nation. I thank you and God bless you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Surly. Can we give another hand of applause, please? Again, um, we this the next day should be the question and answer period of Q and A, where we will make few adjustments to allow for um, community leaders who are here to make few remarks, as she said proffer some new ideas to help the national agenda. Um, we will first begin from the podium here. We have um, some distinguished individuals that are part of the delegation. Honorable Gaia Fowler, former national chairman of the United Party, 
um, Ellen Johnson. And also, um, representative uh, to the parliament from Grand yeah. Cape County, a very prolific intellectual, a man of impeccable credentials, Honorable Gaia family, he will let you know. Good afternoon for everyone. I'd like to begin by really associating myself with the great statements of uh, the pastors here this afternoon. Indeed, I think we should walk out of here taking solace from what they have said. The whole situation about where we are today, it is not about an interview. It's about putting private, putting private interests aside and putting public interest fundamental. Uh, my name is Leon. And I'm from Santa County, so let me make it very simple. As I sat back here and listened to all of the exchanges, I feel some healthy discussion taking place, and people are chanting and also laughing, which is very healthy for our discussion today. But I would like to bring about a very serious question. And this question emanated from the discussion I had with one of my good friends. The friend that I was talking and he asked me, why do you think about Mr. Sally's presidency? I said, what about Mr. Sally? Uh, Mr. Sally is the first woman to be president of Nigeria, the first woman to be president for, for Africa, the first woman to be president for the Black Republic. I said, okay. So then he wanted to say, but you think that's something good? I said, of course, yes. Of course, yes, Mr. Sally went to jail for the struggle. Of course, yes. But my question is, I got a concern, Mr. Sally. I told my friend, if Mr. Sally is elected as president, I fear she may use the gender card and become a dictator. So what would you say to your critics who think if you become president, you may want to use the gender card because I'm the only woman or the first woman to become president in Africa. So I will try to show to this man that I am an iron lady as a shared boy in Nigeria. Thank you. within the company of our 
societal community. My question then becomes, what are your plans? Because you talked about reconciliation, you talked about building community and building the economy. You cannot build a country when people are suffering from high degree of mental illness. I've not seen in many of the platforms that I've read as a mental health professional, I've not seen anything written to address that question. You said you wanted to have a dialogue. I'll wait to hear from you and then we'll suggest some ideas that you could include in your platform. But please tell me what your thoughts are and what are some of the things that you've laid out in terms of policies, in terms of institutional frameworks since you've been working on the governance commission and institutional strategies that would help us. Thank you. Uh, in terms of healthcare, the, what we're proposing to do is first of all to ensure that there's basic preventive types of activities. And here you're talking about ensuring that communities have access to clean water, ensuring that they have access to sanitation facilities to prevent health. I know you mentioned mental health, and I have no expertise in that. But the health agenda is to focus on preventing, and then of course to ensure that in each and every of our villages, as much as possible, as resources will permit, to make sure that there are basic health care in all of those communities where people have access to that. Of course, one needs to have modern medicine, and today, those of you in the health field know this much better than I, the technology has gone so far ahead we're so far behind. How do we turn our county hospitals into the hospitals that can be made as modern as possible? And how do we restore JFK to the referral status to which it, it was uh, for which it was established? That's part of the health agenda. Mental health care, I think one of the first things we're talking about right now, and they may not be somebody who's seriously affected by it mentally, but just the counseling for all of our young people who have been traumatized by what they have watched during the war. So that counseling is something that we want to focus on. Now, should you have some ideas on how we address mental health care specifically, please share them with me so that we can be better informed and we can be able to do something about it. Because we do need the technical help from people like you in those areas where we do not have that expertise. Thank you. Um, yes, we keep giving some friendly reminders, as we will see. If your friend already asks a question, you have to say the same thing again. Jenna, you take the day. It's a family. What we did with.
they should be subjected to the law and they should bear the penalty of the law. We can enforce the law right now because we don't have the political will to enforce the law against any wrongdoing because wrongdoing is so perverse. We have an arrangement in which the government is supposed to enforce the law to comprise those who are <laughs> okay, please call your name. But it would change, yeah? It would change. I think it would change. But I'm talking about the court of law, the last punishment of the future. Because the people will know that it's about the trust will be punished. It won't be something that will be hidden, it will be something that will be secret, it will be transparent, it will be open, it will be legal. And they will know that if they violate the public trust, if they know that if they're dishonest, they know that if they use this use public funds, the weight of the law will come down on them. That one you will see as soon as we get past this transition period. And if you like what you go. My name is Robert Sam Waters. I have two questions for you, Mr. One. The first question is, are yeah, very crucial questions. The first question is one. Thousands of Liberians are residing in the United States. In October, a few months from now, the election will take place in Liberia. This will be the first time that the real election will be taking place. Many of us here are very interested in participating in this election. What can you do, taking into consideration your international protection, for us to have Voting to take place in this country as was done with uh, Iraq. Yeah. My second question is, you are chairman of the Good Governance Commission. We in the United States, when I say we have talked about Liberia, we are very concerned about the corruption taking place in that country. Because it is depleting the, 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 the economic fab fabric. Personally, we hear about auditing going on in Liberia. That was wants to audit the transitional government. What are your comments? Thank you. Uh, when it comes to your right to vote, the absentee vote, unfortunately, the Elections Commission has taken a position on that. And that position is that they're not in a position, they don't have the capacity to be able to allow this to happen. And I think it's because of their fear of abuse, their fear of fraud. They can hardly manage it on the home front. What do you think about? I think if I think if you people had gone to them, not just with a request to say we want to vote this as our franchise, but with some concrete proposals on how you would make it feel safe. How you could have used the Iraqi example or any other example in such a way that they could have the assurance that there would be no, make no abuse of this, you might have got a very favorable response. At this stage, 